Welcome to the arena where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. An unexpected change in the lineup of my podcast meant that I had to come up with a last minute guest this week. When I reflected on who around me had modeled courage, I thought of my mother. And well, she was game. Well, sort of. A special thanks to my brother Lyle and older sister Laura for filling in a few gaps in this story, and to fellow podcaster Carol Blueweiss for interviewing me. Once again, Mum was right. It all worked out. Thank you for listening. This is episode 19. My mom owned a craft store. I think she owned it for about 10 years, and she would enlist us to come and help with inventory. So we would we would be counting pom-poms and googly eyes and all the stuff that's in a craft store over a, a weekend. And my cousins would come along as well and help and my aunt and uncle. And it would just be this army of people going aisle by aisle and, and counting everything, doing inventory on an annual basis. And I love that store. And it was an interesting thing to watch my mother be an entrepreneur. She really applied herself. She worked really hard. She created all kinds of opportunities to bring people into the store. She became a real fixture in the community where that store was and was recognized as one of the best businesses in Fort Saskatchewan, which is where it was. And she joined the Chamber of Commerce. It was an interesting time for me to watch how my mother navigated that. It was a transformation for her. And, it, and that took an enormous amount of courage to take that on as a newly divorced single parent and taking the risk and creating something for herself. So are you going to interview your mom? I hadn't planned on it, but that just made me think of her own story of courage, you know? Um, yeah, I might, uh, might need to do that. <laughs> yes, I might need but- to do that only because I'll be in trouble with my sister and my <laughs> mom if I don't interview all of them. Stella McLaughlin, my mom in the arena. So not to say that you're the last on my list. I was um, going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, somebody uh, had suggested you should interview your mom. I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know if she'd want to do this. <laughs> so my introduction for you is you're my mom. You're a grandmother. You're a former business owner, a uh, big sports fan. You watch just about anything, right? Yeah. Right now I'm watching basketball and hockey. But you've almost always got something on the PVR, whether it's curling yeah. or basketball yeah. or hockey or something. Curling that's... or uh, tennis. Yeah. Tennis. Yeah. What's your favorite sport? I don't have a favorite sport. They're all different and they're all enjoyable in their own rights. Right. I like the competition. I enjoy the Olympics, especially Winter Olympics, because you're competing for something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I interviewed Lyle, there were a few stories that he told that I didn't know. Oh, that really? I, okay. One of the stories was the whole grocery shopping thing. Mm. Whoever gets home starts dinner. I grew up in a different household. At that point, dad was around. I left home pretty much immediately after high school. So being in the single parent household wasn't a long stretch of time. And you and Lyle got into more of a routine I'm going to share Lyle's perspective from my interview with him several months ago. Lyle is four years younger than me and was about 14 when I left home. And just so you understand, in those days in Alberta, you could get your full driver's license at 16 years old, which is crazy to think of now. But anyway, here's Lyle. For her and I, like, I mean, it almost became a partnership in some ways Hmm. uh, because we had jobs, we had roles, we had responsibilities. I started buying groceries as soon as I could drive. That was my weekly job when I was 16, was to go buy groceries. Well, there's not a lot of 16-year-old kids out there that you make the grocery list and you go get groceries. There was kind of an unwritten rule that whoever gets home first, you, you make supper. Mom was working and I was in school and stuff, so you, you had a responsibility to make meals. It wasn't like, Mom, what's for supper? Things got planned out, so it was probably a little different than a lot of other kids. Or was- frankly, for me, because uh, yeah, the, the household had changed. When I was in high school, it was a bit more like you came home, dinner was on the way, all that sort of stuff. 
that sense of responsibility to, okay, I've got to either make the grocery list or plan the meals. That, that wasn't a part of me growing up. I asked my older sister, Laura, about this story. And here it is from her perspective. She always looked after the finances. So it's not like she didn't know how to write a check or pay a bill. She had always been in charge of that. But now she was in a position where she had a very limited income. And so how was this money going to pay for all the bills? And so for that reason, she developed this envelope system. And so she put so much money in this envelope that was for gas and so much in this envelope for groceries and this is for clothes or, you know, and so she'd work from those envelopes. And I I think in the end, it probably drove my brother crazy to have to see her work through these envelopes and not have, she'd kind of have the conversation like, oh, we only got 20 bucks left for gas. So yeah, just keeping track of what you're spending on what, where, was a big part of what she had to do to try and make ends meet. Yeah. I don't know how she did. Also pay attention to what things were costing and OG, the price of X and Y has gone up. So totally. I remember, and again, you know, bananas are a big deal in our family. So, (laughs) (laughs) um, you know, my mother would never, and in my head, it rings 10 cents a pound. And right. mom would never buy bananas if it was more than 10 cents a pound. Like, right. it's just like, no, no bananas. Full stop. Doesn't matter. Not getting it. Okay. Let's get back to mom. The concept of the podcast is about living a courageous life. In thinking about this, I thought, yeah, there is definitely an element of, who modeled showing up courageously. And it was definitely you. And uh, I appreciate your willingness to at least have this conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Does any of what I just said make sense to you in terms of the context of why I would want to have this conversation? I suppose uh, people can be courageous in just living their lives day to day. It's not always a big moment that exemplifies courage, but for some people, it's just a day to day. A good dad that goes to work, that feeds his kids, that's there for them, that does things with his family, is as courageous as the guy who rescues somebody because he was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I I really feel that people are courageous every day in just their own lives. Yeah, I would agree. Whether they recognize it as such is something else. Yes, I don't necessarily think they do or that society does either. You grew up in a a farm family. Your dad ran the dairy and your mom was a stay-at-home mom, though she was very much involved in the church and volunteering. What was dinner conversation like in the Delorier household? Boy, you're making me remember a long ways. I I can't say that I remember anything specific. It was just family stuff. There was no big arguments or discussions. It was just a time to gather together, and we did. Meals were always gathering together. My dad had the dairy, but mom was quite involved in the business side of it as well. Mm Mm-hmm modeling there. She was more involved than just as a housewife. Yeah, Pepe was missing fingers. It was his thumb and index finger. So being able to tie his shoes, it was a bit tricky and he just had his way of, of doing things. And that yeah. was an accident that happened when he was quite young or when did that happen? He was in probably 30s. I, I would guess 30. He was newly married. It happened at the sawmill. Yeah. I never perceived him as having a disability. He was very much a just get on with it person. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't actually see it visually, you would not know he did everything. Mm -hmm. There were certain things that mom would help him with, but generally speaking, yeah, it was never an issue. Yeah. What event in your life has had the most profound impact on you? 
I don't know of one event that has the most profound in, impact. I, I think, as I think about it, certainly being divorced was one, getting married, having children, all these things are just steps. My dad passing away, I think of him often, I do. I cannot think of one thing that had the most impact. There's, when you guys left home, all these things were impactful in a sense, but maybe at different degrees. I suppose if I think the divorce had to be the biggest traumatic in, in that sense of it, it caused the biggest amount of disruption to our family, to our living arrangements and whatnot. And it was the most challenging for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about it was the most challenging for you? I wasn't working. I had been a stay at home mom, had to reconfigure all that, making ends meet, looking after the three Kids, I remember going to a therapist, never been to a therapist in my life and, you know, thought, okay, I need to make sure that everybody's okay. And just talking to her, okay, how do I approach this so the kids are okay? That kind of thing. Yeah. So there was all of that, an awful lot of stuff. Financial, we were okay. We could survive. Going back to school to be able to find work. I remember you being in school at the same time as I was. It was just this sort of weird thing where, yeah, my mom's off, headed off to school and so am I. <laughs> and and I don't remember the sequencing of it, but I remember you bought the store and that, again, was something that sort of radically changed your life, our life, in this in the sense of you had that responsibility. You had to try and make that business work and you had invested a lot of yourself into it. And that looking back certainly has had an impact on me watching you take that on and all of the things that you tried to do to make the business successful, that it thrived and it was a part of the community and it, that you stayed afloat. So what was that time like? It was nice to have a business in the sense that you're independent you're responsible for your employees. And I, I enjoyed having the business, for sure. It was successful to a point uh, that it provided a living. Again, as a single parent, someone who had never run a business before, and, and obviously, I guess, maybe watching your parents run the dairy and kind of understanding what that was all about, whether that had an impact on you to say, I, I want to run my own business. You could have just said, oh, I'm just going to go get a job. But something in you said, I'm going to buy this little business. It, it, it's uh, partly, I was looking for a job and this business ca came available. And so it was kind of one of those things that just happened. I had gone back to school and taken business management. Mm -hmm. So I had some education there that was useful for sure when it came to finances and marketing and all those things that you need to run a business. And mm -hmm. so I was quite happy to go ahead with it. Lyle told me a story around, again, going back to the time of the divorce, the first time we went camping, because we used to go camping all the time as a family when dad was still around. Mm -hmm. And I guess we went camping after dad left. And you were challenged, <laughs> challenged, <laughs> we're suddenly like, okay, how am I doing all this stuff and trying to make that happen. And perhaps that was part of that, trying to normalize or to make us feel like everything's okay. And not everything is upside down. Do you remember that? Part of the challenge was you're hooking up a trailer to a car. You're loading all this. Yeah. There's certainly things that let's say I hadn't done you know, if you have a male in the household, they do certain things and you do certain things for sure. But yeah, we did it. And backing the trailer in, those kinds of things right, is challenging and whatnot. But we wanted to go camping and we did. Yeah. I, I can hear your voice saying, you just get on with it. For sure. For sure. Yeah, you, you do. You just go one step in front of the other and make it happen. And we always camped and it was always something that 
I felt you guys as kids enjoyed. And it was certainly a family thing. So yeah, we had the trailer, so we might as well use it. What does living courageously mean to you? To me, it's an everyday thing. It's choices you make on a daily basis. You choose to get up and go to work, choose to help your neighbor, you choose to volunteer, you choose all kinds of things on a daily basis. It's living your life day to day. It's not one act of bravery necessarily. It can be for sure. Uh, given opportunity, you're in the right place at the right time. Courageous is to be an everyday good things and making choices, some good, some not so good, and then moving on from there, learning from mistakes and successes and whatnot. It's a day-to-day courage to me. Yeah. Mm. What would you do on your last day? Oh, wow. Uh, hmm. Other than being close to family, I think that would be it would be to have conversations with family, just a normal day to say, I I want to do this or I want to do that. Or just because it's your last day doesn't change anything unless you have these things on, let's say, your bucket list that it's stuff you want to do. Well, then you should be doing it. You should be moving forward with doing some of these things. But if you're just all of a sudden because you're going to die as need to do these things, well, you should have been doing it. So to me, it's just, it would be another day. Yes, conversations with family and friends, but yeah. But again, waiting to have those conversations, waiting to be with people that you love and waiting until the last day to suddenly scramble and... Yeah, no. Again, it's living your life the way you want to live and being around the people that you want to be around is important to do while you're living as opposed to trying to cram it in before you die. Exactly. Yeah. What's this COVID time been like for you? For me, it hasn't been too bad. I tend to be happy and content living alone. So it's not a huge issue for me from a, let's say, wanting to socialize and that kind of thing. I keep busy with reading. I do jigsaw puzzles and there's odd little things that come up. I, my grandchildren come once a week each, uh, one on Thursday, one on Friday, and I just keep busy. I don't find it a big sacrifice, but I must admit it is dragging on and it's starting to wear a little bit. You do consider, okay, I shouldn't go out to get this or to do that or those kinds of things. So you do have considerations that you make choices but I don't find it uh, hugely disabling for me. Yeah, I guess I'm an introvert a little bit. You guess. (laughs) I can be. I'm I'm here to tell you. I'm very social, but I need my quiet time. I need my alone time. (laughs) Any final thoughts you'd like to share? Oh, God. Just live your life. What does that mean? Make choices that are right for you. Don't be so concerned about what other people might think or yeah, just live your life so that you're, you're content. Happy is a higher barometer to really be happy, but just to be content, that's good for me. Do you have any other mottos or any other sort of turns of phrase that you use? The only phrase that ever comes to mind, because Lyle glommed on to this, my son, was, it'll all work out. And we used to use that after the divorce. Oh, yeah? Or at that time. It'll all work out. That was one phrase that has stuck around. And mm. every once in a while, it'll crop up half jokingly. Yeah, it'll work out. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, it's the least a mom can do. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> mom is now retired and lives close to her grandchildren in the suburbs of Montreal. How she got there is also a story of courage. At 65, she sold most of her belongings and moved from Alberta, where she'd lived all of her life, to Quebec. My brother, whose wife was very pregnant with their second child, 
flew out to Alberta to help her drive 3,600 kilometers across Canada, arriving three days before my nephew was born. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe, and if you feel someone else might benefit from listening to this episode, please share it. Leave a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. I invite you to follow my blog, where I continue to explore how to show up more courageously. Visit my website at www.lindamclaughlin.com. I look forward to sharing my next guest's story. She's a former boxer, entrepreneur, and now she's the executive director of an inspiring youth charity in Parkdale, one of Toronto's most diverse and economically disadvantaged neighbourhoods. Until next time, my name is Linda McLaughlin in the arena. What the hell's the banana story? I mean, I know there's a story. Oh, well, uh, it's, I would <laughs> never get a banana because <laughs> I'm, I'm very fussy about how my banana has to be. And of course, if it wasn't just ripe enough and maybe I didn't feel like banana today. And so by the time I felt like a banana, they would either be too ripe or all gone. So I never got the banana. <laughs> and, and and you're not bitter about it, are you? No, no. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, I never got the banana. <laughs> <laughs>